Shalom. Beautiful. I want to begin by telling you how deeply honored I am to be here in the Philippines. The Philippines means something very special to the Jewish people. And it's important that you understand what sort of nation you belong to. Seventy years ago, the Nazis, the Germans, rose up and their goal was to destroy my people. Jews throughout Europe had nowhere to run. They had nowhere to flee. A ship named the St. Louis, which held more than a thousand desperate Jews, came to the shores of Cuba and they were sent away. The St. Louis arrived at the shores of Florida. They were desperate. They were hungry. And most importantly, they were running away from Hitler. And the American government did not allow one Jew to come ashore. In desperation, many Jews jumped off the ship into the water. And the American Coast Guard captured them and put them back on the ship. The same ship came to Canada pleading that they might be refugees. And the Canadian government sent the Jews of the St. Louis, more than a thousand desperate souls, back to Europe. And almost all of them were murdered. Almost all of them were gassed in Hitler's ovens. The problem for the Jewish people was there was nowhere to run. There was nowhere to flee. There was no country that would take us in. And as a result, 42 members of my family were murdered by the Nazis, may their memory be erased. But there were exceptions. There was a notable exception. And that's a, a country in Southeast Asia, that's right, called the Philippines. Your president at the time, a Christian, a Roman Catholic, who said to the Jews, if you can come to our country, you will be safe here. We open our doors to you. It wasn't like today where you can just get on a plane. It was very difficult to get from Germany to the Philippines, but many, 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 more than a thousand made it here safely. One of the strangest turns of history was when the Japanese invaded this country. And they set up camps, internment camps for Filipinos. They weren't death camps, but they were places where Filipinos had to stay. 
Strangely, the Jews who had fled to your country had German passports, had Austrian passports. When the Japanese looked at their passports, they said, oh, you're a German, you're an Austrian, no problem. You don't need to go to the camps. In a strange turn of history, here in Manila and throughout this country, Filipinos were sitting in camps as the Jews who you let into your country walk the streets freely here in the Philippines. God bless you. More importantly, remember this. Your blessing will never be forgotten by the God of Israel. Because in our darkest moment, you were there. Friends will smile when things are going well. But when the Jewish people were desperate, your people extended a hand to my people. And today, thousands and thousands of Jews are alive because of the greatness of the Philippines. We will never forget your kindness in our darkest hour of need. Thank you. I want to tell you about another dark period of Jewish history. Jewish history, if you're reading the Jewish Bible, the Hebrew Scriptures, is filled, is pregnant with great tragedies. Why is not germane to this program? I remember as a young child, it was 1973, October 6th. Jews, we were in our synagogues praying. It was Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year, the Sabbath of Sabbaths. And suddenly, at two o'clock in the afternoon, the combined forces of the Egyptian and Syrian armies attacked the Jewish state. Jews were in their synagogues with their prayer shawls, with their tzitzit, praying to God. And suddenly, Israeli military vehicles pulled up in front of every synagogue and took the men to go right to battle. The Arab world sought to destroy us, thinking that, well, Yom Kippur, the Jews are praying. They're not ready for battle. But God had another plan. Normally, it's difficult to collect soldiers. You have to go house to house. But in the Holy Land, on Yom Kippur, the homes are empty and the synagogues are full. The Jews are ready to get on their transports and to go to the front line and to battle. They were fighting for their lives, for the existence of the Jewish people. The land of Israel is a very tiny country, only 26,000 square kilometers, that's it. At the time, Israel was running out of weapons. They were running out of bullets. It was a very difficult war. They desperately needed a replacement of armaments. At the time, the President of the United States, Richard Nixon, as we know today, he did not love the Jewish people like you do. But Richard Nixon, it was very important to him that Israel would not be destroyed. Not because he loved the God of Israel, 
We would listen to his tapes later and he would curse us. He said some of the most disgusting things about my people, but he hated communism. And he knew that Israel was the only democracy in the Middle East. Israel had to be saved. And God used him. God used this wicked man who would be removed from office one day. And he decided to send and replenish all of the weapons that Israel had, tanks, armaments, to be shipped by massive cargo planes, C-130s, from the United States directly to Israel. There was only one problem. The problem was that when a C-130, when a Hercules, when a cargo jet is full, it cannot fly nonstop from the United States to Israel. It's too heavy. It needs to be refueled. Every country turned down the United States, except for Portugal. Portugal it did not love the Jewish people, but Portugal needed a, a better trade deal with the United States. It wasn't afraid of a boycott of its oil, because it had plenty of it. So Portugal owns the Ozark Islands and allowed American cargo jets to refuel. And as a result, Israel was resupplied with new armaments, tanks, bullets, plane parts. And in less than a month, a miracle happened. The state of Israel defeated all of her enemies, just like the Bible said she would. But I remember shortly after the war, the Arabs were very angry. The Arab world was enraged at the United States, that it would supply weapons. And there was a boycott by the OPEC nations against the United States. No oil. No oil was to be shipped to the United States. And the price of oil, I remember this as a child, the price of oil tripled overnight. There was no oil. You had to, if you wanted to put gasoline in your car, if you wanted to fill your car up with oil, you had to wait for miles at a gas station all day just to get gasoline for your car. And a terrible Jew hatred broke out all over America. There were big signs in the United States. I was 13 years old. I remember it like it was yesterday. Signs that were put up all over the country. Jews go home. We don't want Jews, we want oil. This is the United States of America. This wasn't the Soviet Union. In the United States of America, I remember bumper stickers. Jews go home. My car doesn't run on bagels. That's what the sign would say. We don't want Jews. We don't want you. We want oil. Get out of our country. Imagine what it was like in the United States, wherever you went as a Jew, seeing signs, Jews go home. After all, now Americans, because they had aided Israel, couldn't put gasoline in their cars. And you don't take away a car from an American. Jews go home. I couldn't walk the streets during the daytime where I'd be beaten with no question. Cars would stop and spit and throw rocks at us. My mother wouldn't allow me to leave the house. It was a terrible explosion of anti-Semitism all over the United States. In January of 1974, there was a letter written to the newspaper in Colorado 
called the Colorado Gazette. The letter was written by someone who's not Jewish, by a Christian. He wrote a letter to the editor. And that letter was reprinted more than 250 times throughout the United States. I'd like to read it to you. Listen very carefully. Jews go home. <laughs> well, now, there's nothing new about that. Never in the past have you taken this gentle suggestion to move on. But heaven forbid, just this once, you thought that the expression of a few sick people in this country represents the, the, the conviction of all the wonderful people of ours, and all of you Jews start to pack your bags and leave for places unknown. Jews go home. We don't want Jews. We want oil. But before you leave, can you do me a favor? Would you leave behind the formula for the salt vaccine? You, want, you wouldn't want to let my children get polio. And would you leave behind your knack for government, politics, persuasion, literature, good food before you leave? And leave us your secret to succeed. And please have pity on us. Please show us the secret of how to make such geniuses as Einstein and so many others who helped us and perhaps the fact that we're alive today. Instead, we could have been looking up from our chains and our graves at Hitler, old but glad, driving slowly by in one of our Cadillacs had he succeeded in creating the atom bomb and not us. On your way out, Jews, will you do me another favor? Will you please drop by my house and pick me up too? I'm not sure that I can live too well in a land where you are not to be found. For if ever you were to leave, love goes with you. Democracy and morality goes with you. Everything that I and my buddies fought for during World War II goes with you. God goes with you. Just pull up in front of my house. Slow down. And honk your horn. Because so help me, I'm going with you too. Sincerely yours, William Aiken. Not a Jew. If the Jews were ever to go, then God goes with you. What does that mean? What did the Jewish people bring to the world? There's a strange thing about our people. I know that we are deeply loved here at this university. And you are very fortunate to have a, a leader, Dr. Carey, who's a dear friend, lead you in your walk with the Lord. 
And I know that the Philippines is a, it's a very special country. Jews do not experience anti-Semitism here. You can be proud of that. But I need not tell you that not all Christians feel the way you do about the Jews. As you know, the Christians of Europe do not look favorably upon our people. You know this. You study the history. The Jewish people were slaughtered in Christian Europe. But there's something very interesting about the Jewish people. Most of the world is not crazy about us. Almost every day at the United Nations is passing another resolution condemning Israel, of all countries. Not North Korea, not the Sudan, not Iran, but Israel. Most of the Christian world are not real Christians. I will not lie to you. You know this already. You study the history. You understand the history of the Crusades and the Inquisitions. And the Muslim world. I am the rabbi of Indonesia, the fourth largest country in the world. I'm the rabbi of the country. Indonesia is a country that's friendly to Jewish people because it's an, an Asian country. And Asia has, doesn't have a history of anti-Semitism. But you know that the Jewish people in the Islamic world often are not loved. It's unfortunate. But what is, what is very interesting is that although the Jewish people throughout history have been hated by so many nations. The Philippines stands alone. You're not the norm. There is one thing that the world's nations, whether it's Christian or Muslim, believe without question is that the Torah of Moses, a blessed memory, is the living word of God. Two-thirds of the world's population believe that the five books of Moses and Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Judges are the living word of God, heaven-breathed, divinely inspired. Every Christian in the world believes this. Protestant or Catholic, every Muslim believes this. Sunni or Shia, it makes no difference. They're not crazy about us, I confess. They're not wild about the Jewish people. You know this. But for some odd reason, there's something about the Torah that is so unique that the world is compelled to say, that is the word of God. Muslims do not believe in the Christian Bible as the word of God. Let me be clear about this. They believe that the Injil, meaning gospel, is the word of God, but they do not believe that the Christian New Testament, as you know it today, is the word of God. They believe it's completely corrupted. Christians do not believe that the Quran is the word of God. It's the way it is. But what everyone agrees on is, you see that book delivered to us by Moses, a blessed memory? That is the living word of God. In fact, the prophet Moses is mentioned in the Quran 130 times more than any other prophet. Why? Why are people so convinced that that book had to be from God, has to be divinely inspired. I can stake my life on it, more than my life, my eternity on it. And it's clearly, as I've illustrated, 
not because they like the Jews so much. It's not because we won so many popularity contests. One may argue that although we don't have a monopoly on suffering, no nation has been persecuted more than the Jews, no nation has hated more than my people. One could easily make that case throughout history. Yet the world is willing to concede, although we don't like the Jews, their Bible, their Torah is the living word of God. That's very powerful. People generally, if they don't like a certain group, definitely are not interested in their holy book. If, if there is a religion that you don't particularly care for, it's very clear you're not going to spend your time reading it, let alone believing in it. What is so compelling about the Torah? That two-thirds of the world, two out of every three people will say to you, I will stake my life on it. That Torah is holy. Why? Why is it different? Why is it unique? How could you be sure? How can you know? You, I am sure, have a love for the Jews, but why is it that people who even don't love the Jews will say, look, we don't really like the Jews very much, but their Torah is holy. And don't you dare say a word against Moses, because every word of it is heaven-breathed. What is so compelling about this book? And it is this, my brothers and sisters, that I'd like to spend a few minutes discussing with you. I would submit to you that there can be no question that, it, that is more important than this. Can I stake my eternity on this book? I mean, people have opinions about God, but you ever wonder what's God's opinion? What does God think? Look at the Torah. What is it about the Torah? Why is it so compelling? There are many reasons for this, and I would like to spend the few minutes that I have with you tonight to point you to one that is most critical, because it is the foundation, as a Jew, it is the foundation of our faith, the Torah. The Torah is our rock. It is based on the Torah that every decision a Jew makes is fine-tuned by the Holy Scriptures of Moses, our teacher of blessed memory. I don't know how many religions there are in the world. Here in the Philippines, there are hundreds. The same thing in Indonesia. There are, of course, major religions in this country. There are very large Catholic and Protestant and Muslim community here, but there are many other old-time pagan religions in this country as well. Indonesia is the same. We have 225 million Muslims, 25 million Christians, but there are many Hindus and Buddhists and so on. There are probably thousands of religions in the world. I don't know the number, no one does. If you want to begin your religion, religions, all religions, can be divided into two categories. They could have begun in one of two ways. There is no exception to this. One method in the way a religion began, the story of the religion is as follows. God spoke to me. God spoke to me in upstate New York. My name is Joseph Smith. God spoke to me somewhere in Iran. God gave me a prophecy, and now I am going to give it to you. 
That's called an individual revelation. And then you might believe the message or you might say, I don't believe it. A religion can begin with someone who claims to be a prophet, who may or may not be, but he has a message. And you either believe the message or you don't believe the message. That's one way to start your religion. There's a second way a religion can begin. And it's what's called a national revelation. Let me explain to you what that means. A national revelation means a religion that begins, not where somebody comes forward and says, hey, God spoke to me. No. The entire nation, every single person, hears the voice of God. An entire nation had a revelation, prophetic revelation, directly from God. The whole people was there. Every single person was present and saw the voice of God. And I'll say that again, saw the voice of God. Saw the fire and the smoke. There is no other way to begin your religion. Either an individual re revelation, God spoke to me, or God spoke to everyone who was there, everyone. I'd like to ask you a question. Let's say we want to start our own religion. We can make a lot of money in religion, trust me. If you're not sure, watch, turn on your TV and watch some of the people on there and look at the suits they're wearing. They're doing very nicely. Of these two methods of revelation, which is superior? Which is the better claim to make? Which claim is a better claim to make? Is it an individual revelation or a national revelation? Which is more credible? Exactly. It is clear that a national revelation is far more, if everyone saw it, like 9-11, everyone saw it, one way or another. A national revelation is far more credible than somebody saying, trust me. Nothing could be more plain than that. It is the most powerful way that a religion can begin. God doesn't just reveal himself to one person, but the faith is founded on a national event. As it turns out, ladies and gentlemen, if you study all world religions throughout history, you will find that every single religion, with one exception, began with an individual revelation. Only the Torah was given to an entire people. Only one time in history did a nation hear the words, I am the Lord your God, that took you out of Egypt from the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods upon my face. An entire nation heard it. An entire nation bore witness to that event. No other nation ever made such a claim. Ever. Not before and not after. Now, I asked you earlier, which is the better superior revelation? And everyone went, national revelation. But if we look at the world of the thousands of religions from Africa to East Asia, every single one with one exception began with an individual revelation. Why didn't any other religion begin by somebody claiming that everyone was present, everyone heard the voice of God? 
Why was there never in history another religion that began with the claim, which is clearly a superior claim, that God revealed himself to everyone, not just a single person or a small group of people. Can anyone tell me why? Exactly. Because it's the one claim you cannot make unless it's true. Let me explain. If I say to you that, you know how I got here from the airport tonight? It's a big drag. Manila's got a lot of traffic. Not as bad as Jakarta, but it's pretty bad. I wasn't going to make it on time. And Dr. Carrig was kind enough to arrange a helicopter to bring me here to, so that I can get past traffic. And I thank you so much for making that possible. Might I convince you that that happened? Yeah. Never met me before? As a nice shirt? Probably telling the truth. I might be able to convince you that the way I arrived here tonight was by helicopter because of the terrible traffic in Manila. Let me change my claim for a moment. Perhaps, what would happen if I said to you, not only did I come here tonight by helicopter, but every one of you arrived here by helicopter this evening. What would you all say? You're a liar. You might convince me that you came by helicopter. You may convince me that God spoke to you. But the moment I say that God spoke to everyone, you're going to go, you know, I, <laughs> I was watching, I was reading the newspaper and nothing happened when I was there. See, the moment I include everyone else in on it, if it didn't happen, if it is not true, you are immediately exposed as a liar. It cannot happen. It's the one claim if I include everyone in on it. If I say that God spoke to me, if we decide we want to just, we start our own religion here in Manila, knock on the doors and say that God revealed himself tonight in this chapel, and um, we, we pass that message, maybe we'll convince people, but we cannot convince people in Manila that God reveals himself to them as well. Then they know you're making it up. And that's where the National Revelation of Torah goes on. The Torah is an event that the entire nation of Israel was present. And we said, Nasa v'nishma, we will do and we will listen. The power of God was so great when the nation heard the voice of God, they turned to Moses. Only after two commandments, they said, Moses, <laughs> we, we know now that God is speaking through you, that you're his prophet. Because um, they literally would drop dead from hearing the prophecy. They, they, their souls could not take it. They said, we know now, in verse 18 of chapter 20 in the book of Exodus, we know now that God is speaking through you, why don't you get the rest and we'll listen to you. But they first had to hear it from God. I remember many years ago, I was teaching at a university in, in the United States, a, a, a much more liberal university, and I was speaking to the audience and I was teaching this and, and there was a fellow it's right there in the corner. And he was going like this. Now, when you're teaching and some, some student is going, <laughs> right? It was clearly something was bothering him. So I said, is, do you have a problem with anything I just said? He said, yes, I do, Rabbi. He said, everybody knows that the Jews are they're pretty clever people. People say nasty things about Jews, but very few people will say, we don't like Jews because they're stupid. Jews are smart. Moses must have been a very smart fellow. 
Joshua, his assistant, I'm sure he was bright. I mean, after all, the, the Bible is the most published book in the world, in human history. Could they not have gone to the Chinese, borrowed some gunpowder that they had invented? There's a theory that the ancient Israelites had electricity, battery power. So they had lights going off behind the mountain, explosions going off behind the mountain. The people thought they were having a national revelation, but it really wasn't. Isn't it possible that Moses got the nation to believe that they were having a national revelation with the speaker system, I am the Lord your God? And there's someone talking behind the mountain. Isn't that possible? That's an excellent question. The Torah tells us something very interesting. For those of you who have a Bible with you, take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 30, chapter 4, verse 32 to 39. Because God is speaking here. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 32. God is speaking to you. He is speaking to you. And he begs you. The author of this book is speaking to each and every one of you. And God says, Kishalna Lishonim Rishonim, which means ask yourself, please. Ask yourself from all time that has gone past, from one end of the world to the other end of the earth that God created, has there been any other nation that has heard the voice of God as you have and lived? Will there be another people ever in history that will make the claim of a national revelation as you have today? You have been shown so that you might know that I am God and there is no other. The author of the book was not afraid that one day another religion would come along and claim a national revelation because the book, this holy book, says it will never happen again once in history. And I swear to you, no nation will even make the claim of a national revelation but you. And it is for this reason that billions of people around the world turn their eyes to the Word of God, to the Torah, and say, Hashem hu Elohim, the Lord is our God. This is a completely unique claim in history, never before and never to repeat it again. And the Bible says no one ever will make this claim. In fact, if tomorrow another nation rose up and claimed that God revealed himself to everyone, you could take your Bible and throw it in the garbage. But have no fear, it'll never happen. Before I take your questions, I want to read to you a very a speech that was made by the first Prime Minister of Israel as he stood in front of the United Nations in 1948. About 300 years ago, a ship set sail for the New World, and its name was the Mayflower. Its passengers were Englishmen. They become, just became disgusted with their government and the society they had built. They set out for some search for some deserted shore to establish a new life for themselves. 
They landed in America and they were the first founders of that land and that people. This was a very important event in history of both England and America. And for this reason, to this very day, every American child knows of the Mayflower, that ship, the Pilgrims, Plymouth Rock, and November 25th and Thanksgiving Day. I am, however, very curious to know if any Englishman or American, for that matter, is aware the hour in the day that the Mayflower set sail. Does any child or adult know how many pilgrims there were on this historical voyage? What were the names of their families? What did they wear? What did they eat? Where did they get water to drink? What path did they navigate? And what happened along the route? Behold, it was more than 3,000 years ago that the Jews set out from Egypt. Every Jewish child knows all over the world, in America, the Soviet Union, Yemen, Germany, knows exactly how his ancestors left. It was at dawn on the 15th day of the first month of Nisan. What did they wear? Their loins were girded, their sandals were on their feet, their staves were in their hands. What did they eat? They ate matzah, and they arrived at the Red Sea after a seven-day journey. These children also know the route that their ancestors traveled and what events transpired during the 40-year trek in the wilderness. They ate manna and quail. They drank water from a rock called the Well of Miriam. They arrived at the border of the Promised Land on the banks of the Jordan facing Jericho. They know the names of their ancestors, and they can quote to you from the five books of Moses. To this day, Jews everywhere around the world eat the same matzah. For seven days, starting from the 15th day of Nisan, each year, and they relate the story of the exodus and the tribulation that the Jews suffered from the day they left their land and to wander into exile. And they end each year with the words that they shout, now we are slaves, next year we are free men. Now we are here in exile, next year we will be in Jerusalem in the land of Israel. This is the nature of the Jew. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. question. The question is that the central, most formidable event in Jewish history is the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. That's when we became a nation. The question is that God appeared to Abraham many times. He tested Abraham again and again. Elisha and Elijah resurrected the dead. 
There are many miracles described in the Jewish scriptures that did not occur in a national revelation. Only the Exodus, where the entire nation experienced 11 months of plagues, the crossing of the Red Sea, the 40-year experience in the wilderness, the crossing of the Jordan River into the Promised Land, and the miracles of the Jewish people conquering the land of Israel and their enemies delivered to them. But other events were not in, based on a national revelation. And the answer is that the way we know that Abraham encountered three in Genesis 18, the, the, the way we know of the other events described in the Torah is because they're in the Torah. So the foundational experience is not faith, it's knowledge. The knowledge is that Torah was given to, by Moses to the Jewish people. And therefore we know that everything by faith, everything in the Torah is given, it is true and is from God. In a very similar way, let me explain it this way. When, if, when you go home, you go home to your family and your mom serves you dinner, you don't have to test the food to make sure she didn't poison you. Why? Because you have a lifetime experience that your parents love you very, very much and they do everything to protect you. The foundational experience, it's, if you, you've studied um, geometry, you've studied geometry, yes? So in geometry, you begin with postulates. A postulate means that there are certain things that are axiomatic. They require no evidence at all. It's so obviously true. And from the postulates, we can then produce our, our theorems a squared plus b squared equals c squared, and so on. So we don't have a video, a film, of three angels encountering Abraham. We don't have a film of Elijah ascending to heaven. We know it because the Torah says so. Once we have the national experience, we know that everything else in the Torah is trustworthy.